Um, so the next piece in the program is called Portrait 19, and it's um, for cello and um, and ghost piano. And uh, I wanted to, since we're all students, or most of us are students, and, and I'm a teacher guy, I thought I'd teach a thing. I've been, I don't know, for a long time, American nerd pop culture has been fascinated by um, chaos theory. Uh, I believe in the original Jurassic Park movie, wasn't there a character who somehow figured out via chaos theory that, I don't know, that dinosaurs would have frog babies? Or I, I'm really hazy. Uh, I don't think that's quite how chaos theory works, but I don't know. The, the idea was the, the sort of hidden order that can exist inside of chaos. And I, I found myself actually more interested in it from the other angle, the, the ways in which um, order can have hidden chaos inside it. By having incredibly orderly things happening, you can nevertheless create a sense of emergent chaos. I, this isn't really a different thing. It's just looking at the same phenomenon, I guess, from a different angle. But creatively speaking, it's, it's been really helpful for me. Um, as, as an example of what I'm talking about, so in this next piece, the, uh, the, the example of order creating chaos that I was interested in has to do with taking incredibly regular, almost boringly regular rhythms, but having them align or not align with each other in ways to create complexity. Um, so, so for example, if I have a note happening uh, every, say, four beats, one, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, and I have something else happening every two beats, and I put those together, it's not particularly complex. It's, it's the, you know, that's just kind of what beat, what traditional beat is. But if you take the, um, the, the beats that exist between each statement so that it doesn't have common factors in play, you start getting more interesting rhythms out of this. I think I made you two do a thing where Andy was hitting every four notes harder, but you had to hit every five notes. And so you get something more complex that way. For instance, if I have something happening every three, say four and three, so every four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, versus three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, you get not chaos, but more kind of an interesting interplay between the two. If you just use prime numbers and use lots of prime numbers, you get your threes and your fives, sure, but your sevens and elevens and seventeens and nineteens and twenty-threes and twenty-nines and thirty-ones, throw all of those together, I don't have enough fingers or brain matter to make that happen, but the robot does, hopefully. Let's see. See how it suddenly it's if, if you're not trying to focus on any one note, it almost might as well be randomness. But whenever you hear moments like that happening in the piece, I urge you to try focusing on just one note for a second and let yourself hear how just boringly regular it is, and then flip to a different note and notice its regularity and and how there's that kind of chaos only emerging out of what is actually really just kind of boring. So I'm going to probably play a few notes on the cello because I'm realizing it's been two hours since I've played on it, but uh, then I'll start.
much that was almost a disaster. <laughs> but somehow it all worked.
So, um, are there any questions? <laughs> yes. Go for it. Well, now I'm going back to the fragment of music because you could close on the road yeah. in a hotel room. I don't, I don't have an instrument. Um, well, every once in a while we happen to find a place that uh, has something that I can, you know, but it's mostly just a try out of fingering uh, some weird chord that I'm afraid will break the pianist's fingers, and inevitably would, and so I have to change it. But um, no, uh, I mean, mostly I'm doing this at cafes or, at, you know, in the middle of ruins uh, in Chichen Itza, and, um, I never know what to say to the question, do you hear, do you hear what's happening? I've been surprised to find out what certain harmonies ended up sounding like or what certain relationships sound like, but, but I know the idea of, I, mean, I don't know how to answer the question. I, I know what a half step sounds like, and so when I write one, you know, I, I know that that's going to be nice and crunchy. Um, when it comes to hearing it, yeah, to a point. To a point. I don't know. I'm usually really hopped up on caffeine, as you may. But by the way, none of these pieces are reflections on the place. Don't take any of these to be how I feel about Mexico City or something. It's just what happened when I was sitting there. Um, and, and any guesses you might have as to why I suddenly went to weird new tunings um, in Amsterdam are uh, pure supposition, and I will deny them um, absolutely. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have one. Uh, it's sort of a going on question, uh, but it's like, uh, um, have you, how many piano tracks do you have in that, in that last piece layered on top of each other? And have you considered how many pianists slash pianos would it take to do it live if you were to do it? I don't know if you put footage or how many kind of compute, because that's obviously something. That's interesting. Um, it, it's just one. Um, the, the, the disc clavier can only take one MIDI input, so you have to you know, bounce it all down. At some point, yes, I probably created multiple tracks, but most of the parts I just used weird tuplets. You know, a 19-lit versus a 17-lit, and then just made it into uh, MIDI. I, I don't know, I don't think humans could play most of that. Maybe a perfectly cool version of it could be done, but some of it, I don't, I, I don't think it would be possible no matter how many people you had. I don't know. You want to try? <laughs> that sounds like it may be me. <laughs> okay, thanks. I, I just bought it and uh, brought it over here. Uh, no, this is back there. Um, and actually, we have a second one, I think, in the, uh, in the uh, you know, the building that's not Marshall Field, but Carriage House. Why do I forget that? I think we even had a second over there. Um, it's a thing that can be attached, but the piano itself obviously has to be built to accept that attachment. But you can also just play this as a perfectly good piano. I think it's for recording a performance and then being able to play it back like an old tiny uh, player piano or something. But but I like breaking things and seeing what happens. Yeah. I have another one. Uh, when composing for the guitar, which I mean, I found that fascinating. You clearly have a really good knowledge of what is possible. I don't know that James would agree with that. <laughs> I'm saying I had people write stuff where I, you know it was not playable. Uh, and maybe you had the modified thing. I found that fascinating, those crazy chords and harmonics and different things. You have to. That's fascinating. The, the crazy chords work, right? Yeah, well, no, I, I, to, I, I, gave a, a, I, I gave him a hard time a little bit earlier today, so he's feeling sensitive. What he's, <laughs> me? <laughs> How dare you say I'm sensitive? Everything he wrote was actually very playable, with a few exceptions. And, and this is something I found working with composers. Like, you think, well, this chord works. 
and this chord works. So of course I can just jump between them, right? <laughs> you know, that's the, the types of, so idiomatic to a degree. And there are just a few things where I had to cheat, basically, even though this one idea works and this one idea works, getting between them required a little bit of finessing. Like. And that's a common composer, not even mistake, that's just something that happens. And ideally you're working with a performer and solving those problems as you go, and maybe even finding something cooler in the, in the meantime, too. So. It's so much fun to work with yeah. performers like like Andy and James, where you can have that kind of collaborative um, back and forth. So, typically, I, when you, when you detune or you tune the guitar differently, but you play harmonics, did you collaborate on that somehow to know? No, I, I figured that out. Yeah, that's all you can. Well, because those harmonics he's hitting were all basically different versions of a B, you know. Yeah. Um, and even on a normally tuned guitar, harmonics are going to have slightly different sort of microtonal variation depending on what string they're on. But in a, if in addition you tune one of the strings a quarter tone down, you're going to have three very distinct clashy harmonics. So he knew that enough from his cello playing and guitar playing. But. I just had a vision. You and I were going to make an album called Different Kinds of Bees. The album cover is just like a weird bee flying around a flower, but it's like in an Ooh. alternate universe. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll talk. Well, we'll, we'll check back in um, after after the last piece, but I want to get to a few more fragments.